we're here to talk about church-based training, and it's uh, actually a privilege for me to be able to talk about that topic. A little bit about me, just as a matter of introduction, I am married to my wife Lily for 19 years now, and we have five kids, um, two boys, Daniel and Samuel, 18 and 14, and three girls, um, Emmanuel, Gabrielle, and Rachel, and they're 12, 11, and 10. And they're uh, great kids, just enhancing my prayer life every day. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> we, and we're serving, we are from Madagascar and serving in the country of Madagascar. There is something about being missionary in your own country. You have a heart for that nation. We know the language, we know the culture. We were able to be operational right away. Still remember, uh, we came home on August 1st, 2017 and uh, did our first conference on the 5th of August, 2017. So it was uh, just like, just put the suitcase down, go work. Um, so yeah, so I've, uh, I'm a graduate of the Master's Seminary and uh, went back to my home country then, as I said, in August of 2017, and when arrived, set up a ministry called Madagascar 3M, which has absolutely nothing to do with the tape company, but the 3M stands for the three words in our language for preacher, shepherd, and slave, as our ministry vision is to help the church and work with other um, you know, Christian organizations in the country to identify, train, and equip the next generation of church leaders in our country. And we want them to be preachers of God's word, shepherds of God's people, and slaves of Christ. Because there's one thing that happens in places like Africa is that being a pastor doesn't pay much but it gives you social status. And thus you puff up and you think that you're a big deal. But in reality, you're really not a big deal. Only Christ is a big deal. And so that's why we wanted in the name of our ministry to include the word slave in there. So we're training people to be preacher, shepherd, and slave. And the, what we would like to see, and uh, that dream is coming to reality this year, Lord willing, is that we ultimately want to open a preaching institute, a place where we could actually train people to be preachers of God's word and shepherds of God's people. And that's hopefully happening this year on August, uh, 19th of August of 2023, we're hoping to open our preaching institute. And it's just a joy uh, just to think about that. And so really, if you have a few seconds to spare in your prayer time. If you'd pray for that, it would be wonderful uh, to pray for everything that needs to happen between now and then for that seminary to, uh, to open. Here as well, just want to, uh, because he's here to introduce my ministry partner as well, David Ellingson is from Arizona, but now moved to Madagascar. It's been a year and a half now. <laughs> And uh, it's together that we're trying to get this thing off the ground and uh, to, to see many men trained through that. And we'll come back to that Bible verse later. Um, sorry for that, that's not interesting. But the reason why we're here today is really to talk about the church. And this is our own church. It's Ankadivatu, it's the name of the area that we're in. Ankadivatu Biblical Baptist Church. And it's not because we have unbiblical Baptists in Madagascar. <laughs> Maybe we do, but I don't know about them. Uh, but the reason why it's called the Biblical Baptist is because the missionary that started the work in 1932, a man by the name of Brinley Evans, uh, when he left in 1941, having handed over the work to nationals, the only request he had is for the word biblical to stay in the name of our church. And so that's how we became the Biblical Baptist Church of Antananarivo, which is the name of capital the capital city of Madagascar. So hope you're getting all of that. There'll be a quiz before you can leave later. So I'm hoping you're catching all those names. So it is of an older building, but um, we love it there. We have around 430 members in our church, which for an evangelical uh, church that, down there is, uh, we are on one of the, the, the bigger ones. And uh, uh, so we've been open since 1936. This church has been open since 1936 and so has been a faithful uh, witness to the gospel there in Madagascar. But that is actually what we want to focus on this afternoon. And as we were talking, you know, with this title that could sound a little bit mysterious, the rationale and strategies for church-based training, the, the point I'm trying to make is that the church has a unique calling. The church 
has been called to do something that only the church has been called to. And we see that all through scripture. The church, by its nature, is a unique entity. And no parachurch, no other organization is to trump or replace or do what the church has been called to do. And it's been so sad that over the years, more and more has been relinquished to organizations and other things to the point that the church is not doing what the church is supposed to do anymore. The church is not a place where people just come and gather on Sunday mornings from 8 to 10 or whatever your, 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 your worship time is, and then after that, we just go back to our normal lives. No, the church is far more than that. And so as we, um, the group of elders there at Ankadivatu Biblical Baptist Church, as we looked at this, one of the first things we did is to try to see what is the identity of the church and thus the activity that comes from that identity. What is it that the church has been called to do? Because if we're going to speak about church-based training, well, we're going to train. The training is a means to an end, right? And the end must be what the church has been called to do. What is it that the church has been called to do or what is the purpose of the church? Well, the identity of the church, as we kind of looked at it, is that the identity of the church is to be image and name bearers for Christ. To be image bearers as we've been created, as all human beings, but even more as believers, but also to bear the name of Christ. And it is for that very purpose to carry the name of Christ, to be Christians that the, call, that the church has been chosen by God. God is the one that chose, elected those who are gonna be part of the church. The church has been made alive for that purpose, has been granted the Holy Spirit to help us in that endeavor, to give us that spiritual life, and the church has been set apart for that purpose. You cannot say those three things about any other entity but the church. Only the church has been chosen to do those things. So first of all, as you could see in there, the church has been chosen by God to be image bearers, to be image bearers. We are there, as you can see from the beginning, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, we were created in the image of God, but then sin came in and that image was marred. But yet God had a plan to restore that image progressively through sanctification from glory to glory, as 2 Corinthians 3.18 tells us, as we are growing back in conforming ourselves to the image of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, the perfect image. We're growing in likeness to him. But turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 2. And in 1 Peter chapter 2, I just want you to notice the different names that the church, that is used to speak about the church. You see there in verse 5, in 1 Peter chapter 2, in verse 5, it says, how does it describe this, the, the, the church? The church has been called to be living stones, a spiritual house, a holy house priesthood doing what? To offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. So in that sense, the church has been called to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God or say it in another way, the identity, part of the identity of the church is that the church has been called to worship. The church has been called to worship. Saving, the saving act the fact that God saved us, yes, made us avoid hell and all these things, but mainly it saved us into something, into a group of people that are called to worship the living God, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. But go down to verse 9, and you've seen that already mentioned this morning by Dr. Tatlock, as he said in verse 9, we have also not only been called to be a community of worshiper, but to be a community of witnesses as well. 1 Peter 2.9 says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. 
So salvation brings you into the church and the church has been called to these two things, to worship and witness. And it's not an option. It's not like, well, I feel more like just worshiping or I feel more like witnessing. It's not how you feel. It's what we've been called to do. And we've been called to do both, worship and witness, right? But if you go down to verse 12, now go down to verse 12, continue your way down there. I know we're skipping a few verses, it's okay. And in verse 12, you could see that we are called also to stand out, to be set apart, to be different. The church is called to really stick out like a sore thumb in this world, that people can notice that there's something different about the church. Verse 12, it says, keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them and they are observing, glorify God in the day of visitation. And so you could see there the purpose of the calling, the setting apart, the sanctifying of the church is so that the church could be this unique tool into God's hand to worship witness and and show people in this world that the gospel transforms that the gospel changes you and we are called to have this to have this different to, to, to have this standing out lifestyle in every area of our lives. And as one of the things that we're talking here in this conference is the fact that we are called to stand out not only, you know, in our home lives, but we are called to stand out in the workplace. This quote from Gordon Smith, read it along with me. It says, just says, I mean, you know, just, yeah. If a vocation represents a call of God to serve him in the world, then that vocation is sacred because it comes from God. It therefore makes no sense to speak of secular vocation, but a vocation because it comes from God is sacred. So what, it is, what he's saying is this simply, whatever your vocation is, whatever you do in your daily life, you don't have to be a pastor, but in whatever capacity, in, in whatever place that God has placed you, whatever your calling is, you can stand out. You can be the church. You can be a worshiper and a witness exactly there where he placed you. And that is what he's calling us, the church, to do. As it says there in verse uh, 17 of 1 Corinthians 7, only as the Lord has assigned to each one, as God has called each, in this manner let him walk. And so I direct in all the churches. Just to carry on on this, not like I'm belaboring a point, though I am a little bit, it says that the priesthood of all believers did not make everyone into church workers. Rather, it turned every kind of work into a sacred calling. So whatever is it that you're doing, whether the work of peasants or craftsmen, it is an occasion for priesthood, which means exercising a holy service to God and to one's neighbor. Doesn't that change the way we view our work? But my point this afternoon is not that it changes only our view of work. It changes the way you see yourself as a church member. That you see yourself, each and every one of us, whatever it is, your, the role that you have in the church, that you see that what you do, your vocation, is your occasion for priesthood for God is where God wants you to be so that you could represent a holy God to a sinful world. Okay? And the way, how do we stand out? How do we stand out? And you'll see, we'll, 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 we're making our way to me making my point here. Um, how do we stand out? We stand out through our character, or you can call it our ethic. Christians stand out by the way they behave, right? Another worker, a non-believer, could be excellent in his work in terms of skills. But only a Christian could show the character excellence that comes from having the Holy Spirit and from putting God on display. So I'll just mention five here, a character, characteristics that I'd love to see every Christian worker to have. I'd love to see, I'm dreaming of this day, and it's, it, is, it is a dream, it is a long shot. I'm dreaming of the day where, where you're going to look into the newspapers and, you know, those uh, job ads, 
and there would be a job ad looking for an accountant, and it would say, preferably Christian. It's a dream, right? But I mean, I can dream. It's okay. It's free, right? But wouldn't that be wonderful? Because then it means that the world would have noticed. They say, I'm looking for a plumber, preferably Christian. I'm working for an accountant, preferably Christian. I'm working for a finance manager, preferably Christian. I'm working for, I'm looking for whatever else you could be looking for. Cashier, preferably Christian. Why? Because the Christian will have those characteristics, those character traits that make us stand out. We Christians are to work with excellence because we represent an excellent God. Christians do everything truly. They're not cheating. They're not stealing. They're not doing anything in the back. They have integrity. Christians are diligent in what they do. They are persevering in the work. They are working hard. They are hard workers. They are not lazy. Christians are generous, not only with their money, but with their time as well. A Christian employee is not the one that watch, looks at his watch at 4.49 because, you know, he finishes at 5. And the moment the dial goes on the 5, I'm out of here. He goes one extra mile because he understands what it means to work hard. And, of course, a Christian worker is just. Dr. Tatlock says that Christian ethics are the represent, representation of God's character in practice. This is how we practice putting on display God's character. And so I hope you see what I'm, what I'm leading to here with all of this is that first of all, then the church has been called to do, we've seen already three things, right? The church has been called to worship. The church has been called to witness. And let's say one aspect of that witness and the church has been called to put God's character on display. That's what we've been called to do. And the reason why we go through these is that if you're going to think about church-based training or any training for that matter, the training that you do needs to address these areas. If you're not training, if your training is not training people to become worshipers, there's something missing in your training. If your training is not geared to help people witness, there's something missing in your training. If your training is not geared to help people grow in those godly in, in their godly character, then there's something missing to your training. Do you hear what I'm saying? Do you hear what I'm saying? Yes, Thank you. No, I'm just checking, you know, it's a, you know, just checking the pulse here, you know, or something. Because if training has just become this academic exercise where we fill people's heads with knowledge, but that that knowledge doesn't spur, that, that doesn't, doesn't draw that person to praise God. What's the point? If that knowledge doesn't draw that person to want to go and share about what he has learned, what's the point? If that person doesn't, if that, if that, if that knowledge doesn't transform that person to grow into the image of Christ, what's the point? What's the point of just filling their heads with knowledge? In addition to that, the church, we all know this verse, go to, you know, Matthew 28, you don't need to go there, it's on the screen. But in Matthew 28, we, the church, has been called to be a community of disciple-making disciples. As you all know, the main verb, I mean, most of you would know this, the main verb in that sentence is not go, though some would love it to be go, but it's important to go, though. But the main verb is make disciples. And the way we make disciples is by going by baptizing and by teaching them to observe all that God has commanded. And so if that's the great commission, what is the role of the church and what is the role of church-based training? Look there carefully at the third one. What does it say? It doesn't say, teach them all that I have commanded you. What does it say? Teach them to observe, to obey, to align their lives to all that I have commanded you. And so making disciples involves teaching people to obey, to follow Christ's principles. And so in a summary of that, in a, in a, 
this man, Russell Pliny, sum summarized it like this and by saying, since the mission of God is his glorification and all that he does is related to that goal, thus the aim of the church is first to glorify God, second, we are to proclaim the gospel to all the nation, and third, we are called to make disciples of the converts by baptizing them and teaching them through both word and deed the doctrinal truth of the word of God. Do you see the three aspects there? It says that we are called first to glorify God, makes us worshipers. We are called to proclaim the gospel to all nations, which makes us witnesses. And we are called to make disciples who are transformed um, through word and deed, through the doctrinal truth of the word. They are transformed to become disciples, imitators of Christ. And so in light of that, after having looked at all of that, what we did at, the, at our elder board level, we decided to summarize our mission as the church, as that church, that particular church, that we understand our mission to be the fact that we exist to proclaim, preserve, and display the gospel. And we didn't invent it, we just took it from this book, the missions book for, that was produced by Nine Marks, you know, in that series, those little those little booklets, and there they exclaim, uh, explain sorry, that the proclamation of the gospel, it involves sending people both near and far. The preservation of the gospel means standing on truth, proclaiming it from the pulpit, but also ref refuting false teaching and maintaining doctrinal and moral purity among the members and display the gospel through this stand, stand out lives of its members, this uh, set apart life of its members and the, the way the church uniquely display this unity in diversity. And that's how the church can be, as, as they say, a vivid living color display of the gospel it preaches. And again, the point I was making at the beginning, these missions have been given to the church singularly and not to any other institutions. If you go into all of those passages that are quoted there, it is not mentioned that organizations are to do this. The church must do this. The church must do it. And thus, if we agree that that is the rationale, that those are the principles, that those are the set priorities or the, 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 the set mission for the church, then your, the goal of the church-based training must be what? to fulfill the mission that the church has been uniquely given. That's what we do, right? So go with me quickly to Ephesians 4, just for a second. Okay, no, that's a lie. It's not going to take a second. But if you go to Ephesians 4, and you know these verses, but look at verse 11, starting in verse 11, 11, and 11 we're going to start at verse 11. And he gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers. For what purpose? For the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. So what he's saying is that the reason for being for the church for the church and especially the church leaders is just to equip the church, to equip the people in the church to do the work, to do the work of the ministry, to do the work of service here, to build up the body of Christ. So it is essential that any kind of training that you develop at your church, that that training serves the purpose for which that training exists. And the purpose for which that training exists is to develop in your congregation an understanding of worship, that they will understand what it means to be holy gods and how God deserves all the worship by every people, by every, in every nation, tongues, and tribes. That, you, that the training must also develop into your congregation the ability and zeal to witness, that they would have an increasing desire to witness that the training that you develop trains them and helps them to have distinct Christian ethic and character, that they would be morally standing out wherever they are, wherever they work, that they would understand the mandate to be discipled and to disciple. 
and we'll continue to talk about that. But it is this big chain, right, that the Lord is building of one generation passing on, passing the baton to another generation and growing at the same time while as well still passing it on to another generation and so on until the, until the Lord returns. But we must also train them to have the capacity to do those three things that we talked about also, the capacity to proclaim, protect, and display the gospel. And again, as I mentioned, the church must be trained to do that. That's the purpose of church-based training. That should be the purpose of any training. And so I don't know how many of you here are uh, leading or involved into uh, or developing church-based training in your churches, but this is a good way for you to assess that that training that you have is going in the right direction. If it's not achieving any of those, well, what's the point? Again. But maybe there's also in some cases where it's achieving some of it, but not all of those things that are described up there. And so it's an opportunity for us to again reflect based on what we've seen in God's word on what is it that we're trying to achieve? What is it that we're trying to achieve? I don't know around here, but in, um, in Madagascar, in Africa in general, there is a tendency of loving programs, of loving to develop, to just do stuff, you know. So we would create all of those different sections, you know, where you have the, uh, the single ladies club and the, you know, the boys bachi ball club and then the whatever else in the church. And we create all of those programs, right? But I go back to one question, what's the point? What is it that we're trying to achieve? Training must be designed so that the church is equipped to fulfill the unique mission that God has called the church to do, okay? So based on that, how do we do that? How do we develop faithful church-based training, equipping, discipleship, however you wanna call it? Same thing, all right? Go with me to 2 Timothy chapter 2. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, we'll just look at verse 1 and 2. Verse 1, it says, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, and trust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And so you could see here kind of a blueprint, we could call it a blueprint or a pattern for faithful church-based training, as we're talking about. And the first thing that you see there in verse one is that church, faithful church-based training involves building close relationships. And that's why Church, I mean, training must be church-based because the church is the place where you develop those relationships. One of the things that we see in that in a lot of institutions and the bigger they are, training institutions, is that those relationships do not happen in the same way. There would be, for instance, you know, in those big training institutes, there would be the professor, this side of the desk, and there would be the students, the other side of the desk. The relationship between those is just that they see each other when it's class time, and that's it, right? On a church-based training, you're part of the same church, you're doing life together. And as you're doing life together, at least that's what that should happen, is doing life together, you grow in intimacy, in knowledge of one another. You have a strong personal relationship that is developed. Look there in the verse, look at how Paul talks about Timothy, what does he say? He first fronts the word you, just to to say that after having talked about these other people before, he wants now to focus on Timothy. It's a very personal address. And he says, how does he call Timothy here in verse one? My son, my son. That word didn't just come out of the blue, okay? I know that there's some part of the United States where you love to call people endearing words, even people you don't know. You know, I've been in the south of the United States and 
some ladies I don't know always call me honey every time they want to serve, you know, tea to me. And I'm like, I don't know you, you know? <laughs> and so, anyway, but it's just the way it is, right? <laughs> but uh, so endearing terms can be thrown around, but here I don't think Paul is throwing it around, right? There is that relationship. Look there in chapter one. What does it say? Uh, in chapter 1 and in verse 2. So he says, verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to promises of life in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my beloved son. You could see that there's endearment there. You could see that there's a relationship that has been built there. And you could see that that relationship was built not out of thin air. Go with me to chapter 3, 2 Timothy still, but to char chapter 3, and starting in verse 10, what does it say? Now you followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, perse persecutions, and sufferings. Do you see there? We've gone through thick and thin. We have seen it all. We've gone through good times and through bad times together. We've done life together. This is how discipleship happens. Discipleship happens when there is that life-to-life -life interaction, when there is that life-to-life -life sharing of the grace of God, of seeing God taking you out of those tough times, seeing God teaching you in those moments. And those relationship, that relationship building happens the best in the context of the local church. Transfer of knowledge can happen anywhere. By the way, it can happen through a compu computer screen. Can it? Can't it? Right? But these other things that he's talking about, how on earth you pass them through a computer screen? You have to be together with the people. And you have to both learn together to observe that goodness of God, that grace of God that Paul is appealing to, if I'm going back to 2 Timothy chapter 1, as he's saying, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. He's pointing Timothy to what really matters, and that is the empowering by God for him to be strong in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. As a teacher, as a mentor, he's pointing Timothy back to what matters. So church-based training, the strength of church-based training is based on the fact that it enables us to build close relationships. And those relationships enable modeling. It enables not only teaching, but it enables modeling. As you could see there in 2 Timothy 3, verse 10 and 11, Paul demonstrated to Timothy his conduct, his faith, his love. And Timothy could observe it, could observe what does it look like to have faith? What does it look like to love others? But if, you, if you're back in 2 Timothy 2 and you know this verse, this very famous verse, faithful church-based training also involves faithful teachers and faithful students. Okay? And you know this verse. You know this verse very well. And... As, mentioned, as often mentioned, when that verse comes, we see that we see four kind of levels here. There's the Paul level that teaches the Timothy level, if I want to use the word level, that teaches the faithful men level, and then the faithful men are to teach who? Everybody else. Okay. So here's a good question for you because, you know, I, want you to, I don't want you to sleep, guys. If you are already, may God have mercy on your soul. <laughs> but um, <laughs> so in those four levels, which one are you? That was a question, guys. So, <laughs> so I'm kind of expecting an answer. It's just the way questions work. <laughs> All of them, says Mr. Bismeyer here. <laughs> Who else has another opinion? Which one are you? So are you Paul? I mean, or Paula? I don't know. <laughs> are you Timothy? Are you faithful? The faithful man level? Or are you the others? Both. Huh? Both. both? Oh, both the four. <laughs> I mean, you can be Bo 
Yeah, go ahead, man. Speak your heart, brother. Yeah. You could be a faithful teacher as well as a follower of another faithful teacher. You could be faithful teacher as well as a follower of a faithful teacher. Anybody else agrees with Sam, Sam here? Yeah. All right. A few others agree with that, right? Well, it seems to be that in the course of our Christian life, it seems that we could be any of these four things, can't we, right? We could be in some cases, and for some people, we have people that are our Paul, that are teaching us, right? But comes a point where we have ma matured enough to be the one teaching as well, right? But as uh, one clever guy, Gary Kuhn, said, discipleship training is the spiritual work of developing spiritual maturity and spiritual reproductiveness in the life of the Christian, okay? You got that? Me neither. The way he says this, he says it another way. He says, a multiplier is a disciple who is training his spiritual children to reproduce themselves. So here's what he's saying. I'm, I'm still trying to, you know, dumb it down to my level. What he's saying is this. Not only are teachers to teach, but they are to teach students to teach. Do you guys understand? Still not. All right. Let me try one more. We are not only to pass on information. We are to pass on also the ability for those we are teaching to also pass on information. Right? Got that this time? So we try one more? Yes, sir. Indirectly, we're not discipling the next guy, we're discipling the other guys after through enabling the next guy to be able to disciple others. See what I mean? So that's happening when there is relationship built into the church, when there are, there are close relationships that are developed and, 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 and that way as well, we'd be able to identify those who are faithful because look there, the only qualification here for who must be taught and who must be entrusted with this ministry of passing on the baton, look there in verse two, it says that it must be faithful men, faithful people. So it's people that have already proven themselves to be faithful that you equip further, that you teach them to yeah the ability to to teach others so the quality of faithfulness is that quality that is best observed and lived out in the context of the local church and so what we want the product again is people that will be able to teach others also and that's how we carry on this battle of the faith by training people to train people. And so how do you do that? That's the next question. Okay, now we understand that faithful church-based training involves building close relationships, but it involves as well having faithful teachers and faithful students. But so how do you get there? Well, I'm glad you asked. Well, you get there through a, a, a few means. First of all, well, you need to teach, <laughs> right? It's kind of hard to teach without teaching. So you have to teach. But you have also to allow them to shadow you, to come alongside you, to go with you. The less mature believer that you have chosen to be discipling, you allow them to shadow you, to follow you. And that is very easy to do when you have nothing to hide. It's harder to do if you have stuff to hide, right? So it calls to us to have lives of integrity, that we don't have anything to hide. We could do, in that sense, it needs to do life-on-life -life discipleship. It happens if it's not only him that we ask to be open and honest about their struggle when we are not, when we are patronizing him by trying to portray ourselves as this perfect Christian that never sins and never doubted one moment all the promises of scripture. If we are this patronizing guy, we're just creating a distance rather than between you and the one you're trying to disciple, rather than showing that it is a life on life, back and forth, 
mutual sharpening of one another, right? You need as well to give this person you're discipling opportunities to prove their faithfulness and serve, especially if you're in church leadership. You give them opportunities to prove their faithfulness and service and help them to use their gifts and talents for the Lord. They've all been given one. I know some of them, it's well buried, but it's there, okay? It's there somewhere. They have some kind of giftedness. They may not look very gifted from the get-go, but if you spend enough time, you find, ah, there you go, you can do that, huh? And then you could use that to, to, and help them to serve the Lord, okay? But you also give them opportunities to prove their ability to really minister, not only then using their gifts and talents, but really to do the things that we faithful men are called to do. What is it? It's to teach, to evangelize, and to counsel, right? To teach people to observe what God has commanded. And, well, another, I think, distinctive element of church-based training would always be that there would be a way for you to test it, to touch, test knowledge acquisition. So in Madagascar, we have a, a proverb that says, saying yes doesn't break, break your neck. Okay, what does that mean? So I could say yes to anything, doesn't break my neck, doesn't hurt, you know? Did you understand? Yes. Are you getting what I'm teaching you? Yes. Is what I'm trying to communicate clear to you? Oh, yes. Why? Because yes doesn't break my neck, so I can say yes to anything, right? But the only way that you're going to be really able to evaluate if it did really get through is not by just asking that, but it's by testing it, right? You need to test or assess knowledge acquisition, growth, basically. And that's a biblical principle. I think uh, 1 Timothy 3.10 has that that before appointing someone, that person must have been tested, evaluated for their ability to that. And so this shows you a little bit of some of the elements, let's say, of that church-based training. That you're, the, the way you do training then, when you're thinking church-based training, I don't know what you guys were thinking about getting here and you'd be like, well, that was not what I was thinking. But anyway, it's not just the teaching part, right? When you're thinking church-based training, we're just thinking classes, but uh, sometimes. But what I'm trying to show you is that church-based training is, enables you to do much more than just classes on how to be the perfect Christian. It enables you not only to teach, but also to model. And not only to teach and model, but to teach, model, and give that next generation, that next guy, the opportunity to teach and model as well. And that's what makes church-based training unique. Well, we are blessed in our church with uh, a lot of very, very gifted young people. Uh, one of the things in uh, the population of Madagascar is that 65% are under the age of 24. 65% so of the overall population are under the age of 24. So we have a lot of young people. We have plenty of them running all around. So what we try to do is catch some of those who are running around and uh, we give them opportunities to serve. We give them opportunities to be with us. And so this, for instance, we would call it a home invasion uh, because it is. Where we would have just a bunch of youth at our house. That's our, that's our living room. Uh, I assure you there's uh, furniture somewhere down there. Uh, but uh, that's what it would look like. We would just open our house and uh, have the opportunity to have those young people at our house. And that is not like, you know, uh, that's what the opportunity that we have is that we don't have to go into a classroom and take out, your, take out your copy books and, you know, write down all the wisdom I'm going to pass on to you. We could do it as a life-on-life -life discipleship as well. And so we would gather and we would um, do those things that we were talking about, trying to help them in those three areas of becoming worshipers, of becoming witnesses, and of growing in the character of, of Christ. And uh, one of the things that Malagasy people love to do is to sing, and um, that's a general statement, that's not me, so I'd rather have you listen to them than to suffer through my singing. And so let me uh, try to see if I can make this work. This is just like one of those uh, Friday, it would be like a Friday evening at our house 
would have a bunch of young people over. Uh, sometimes it would be just the girls and sometimes it would be just the guys, but sometimes it's together. And my wife would take the girls and I would take the guys and we would be able to uh, pour into them. And one of the things, as I said, that they love to do is to sing. So I just wanted to give you a taste of Malagasy singing. Is that okay? Even if it was not, I would have played it because, you know. How was that? <laughs> yeah, no, they can sing, really. And you use some of their abilities like that, like singing, and give them opportunities to serve uh, in, in that way as well. But, you know, as we sing together or we do these kind of things, it's, uh, it's just like a foretaste of heaven, isn't it? And, and that song, by the way, on the left, that's the lyrics. It's a song that is uh, basically putting Revelation 4, 11 and 7, 12, and it's uh, a co-elder with me at the church that wrote that song. So... Uh, anyway, it's just, it's just really beautiful. I just wanted you to see that there's worshipers of your God and the other part of the world as well that are singing to his glory. The other thing you do is that you're involved in their lives. And the thing with working with youth is that they get married to one another a lot. And so uh, I, t I tend to go and do a lot of weddings. Okay? So in the, course, in the course of the ministry, but that's you sharing life with them right? And I do their premarital and I, I, I'm able to really, you know, see them from the outset of their married life to, uh, to, to, to everything that they're doing as well. And so that's just a joy. Uh, you know, Galatians 4.19 says, you know, Paul speaks of the joy of seeing Christ formed in them. And that's what I tell them every day that I'm just, it's my joy to see Christ formed in these young people as we do life together. But we also serve together. And so we give them opportunity to be staff and to serve at conferences, like a conference like this one, just smaller, uh, uh, is what we do. We just had one in November where we had, uh, you know, Conrad Mbewe over and Justin Peters and other people like that. But the staff, all the people that you see with the green polos are just all young people that we disciple. Those are all young people that we are training for ministry. We, they, they're coming with us and helping us with, to set up conferences, men's conferences, women's conferences. We give them opportunity as well to share the gospel when it was, this was a little bit back then, it, it is to um, go bed by bed at a coronavirus treatment center. You know, the COVID, we had uh, centers for people who, who caught the COVID. And so we would go in there with these young people and we would share the gospel to those people on their, on their beds and, um, and the people that are, that are watching them. We would go in there dressed like astronauts, but you know, we would go in there nonetheless and, uh, and give them an opportunity to serve God in that way and to develop that skill to share the gospel. This is another, um, another singing, another time that, that, that we are singing. We're singing to these people who are at the, at the, you know, on the coronavirus treatment center. I'll probably put it later, but, oh, sorry.
you know this song. Just a sample. <laughs> anyway, all of that to say, these young people could really use their talents to serve God. We had the opportunity as well to have them involved in um, just compassion ministry. And we distributed, well, last year we had cyclones, those are our hurricanes in where we are, and we had the opportunity to give food to 15,000 people, yes. With that little team of ours, we gave food to 15,000 people uh, dur during that period. Those guys, are, those guys are amazing. But as these people are suffering and they are removed from their homes and they are put like 250 people in a small classroom, as you could see there, they have great opportunities. We have a captive audience to share the gospel. And you could see there's one of the team members here, that one of the young people that we disciple that is sharing the gospel there. And so anyway, I just wanted to show you the different things that we do to provide this life-on-life -life discipleship. But the important part still remains teaching, and that we try to do as much as we can of. And I know that it could be different on your context, but if I, there's, there's one thing that I could recommend you to do is to try to basically hit your people different ways to provide as much training as you can to provide them as many opportunities as you can for them to sit under God's word. And so here's, for instance, what we do. Well, of course, there is the Sunday morning sequential expository preaching. We're going sequentially through books of the Bible. We just done 1 Corinthians and we're starting the book of Mark right now. And it's my best friend who is the senior pastor of the church who uh, does that, that, that preaching. But in the Sunday afternoon, we have an afternoon service, not an evening service because uh, Public transport is very bad there, and it becomes very difficult to go home if too late. So our afternoon service is from 3 to 4, and we would do, we would kind of rotate into one of six things on that Sunday afternoon. Either we would do a teaching on a doctrine, or we would do a Bible study on a passage. We're in 1 Samuel 7 right now. Or we would do, we would give an opportunity to one of those young men we're training to preach, or we would do a Sunday afternoon dedicated to missions, or we would do a service dedicated to prayer, or we would do a Q&A by which we answer during one hour one question that the congregation has asked us. And we've been doing this for a while now, and with that, it, it keeping on going, it keeps on putting God's word in front of them, answering the questions that they may have, while at the same time equipping them doctrinally. But after that four o'clock service, you remember we have a lot of young people, right? We have a dedicated service for youth as well, from four to 5.30 every Sunday afternoon. But if that is still not enough, we also have on every Saturday afternoon, we also have a, like a, like it's like a Sunday school, but just on a Saturday, so we called it a Saturday school. And uh, where, we are going sequentially teaching through all the Old Testament, okay? And the Sunday school, after the main service, from 8 to 10 is our main service, and from 10.30 to 11.30, we are going through the New Testament sequentially with everybody in the church. So we would separate the whole church in different age group. You have the 3 to 6, 7 to 9, 10 to 12, 13 to 18, 18 to 25, and the oldies after that. In different, in different sections of the church, and each of them have a teacher that will take them on the Saturday through the Old Testament and on the Sunday through the New Testament. But that is still not enough. And so every second Saturday of every month, we gather the youth, and we're, gonna, we, we're starting this new initiative where we are spending time with them, with those young people. From 9 to 12 on the Saturday morning, we will do something, you know, it could be, could be playing, could be sports, could be uh, a sharing time, or, or usually, you know, we are Baptists, so it involves food most of the time. 
Yeah. And, and uh, um, we would have the, the, the young girls separately and the young men separately so that we could discuss heart to heart. And what we have done is that we have identified some of the more mature young men and young women in our church, and we've asked them as well to go and disciple some of those younger believers as well. But if that is not enough, because that's not enough still, what we do have is twice a month at 6 a.m. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. We have something called, can someone read that for me, please? No? Okay. It's the man after God's own, it's a man after God's own heart pro, pro, program. So remember what 2 Timothy 2.2 2 said? This thing that you have learned from me, entrust them to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So we have this three-year training program for laymen through which we take them the first year through Bible storyline and biblical theology, in year two through hermeneutics and introducing them to biblical counseling, and in year three through homiletics, apologetics, and systematic theology. And the goal is that after those three years, it would help reveal a vocation if there's a calling into full-time ministry. But otherwise, it's okay. It will make them good fathers, good husbands, and good servants in the church. We're just so grateful as to how the Lord has blessed that ministry of man after God's own heart, la facha in our language, le la rakan and I'm sure you got that. Uh, but uh, th there's been fruits, tangible fruits to it. One of them is a man by the name of Nax who has gone to seminary to the TMAI in South Africa following, after following this program and is now back and has joined our faculty. Uh, will join our faculty when we do open the preaching institute in August. And the other man, I just wanted to put him on the spot, is over there, if you could stand up. This is Christian, guys. And uh, Christian has also gone through this program and he's now started in January. He started to attend the master's seminary. He's going to be equipped and the, God has revealed that calling into him and he's going to come back and be an associate pastor at our church and a faculty member as well at our preaching institute. So you see, God does, right? Bring some of those great men that will then be able to carry on the baton. And so just to, I wanted just to show you fruits of that thing that we're trying to do. The other thing that we do, because that's still not enough, is that on Friday afternoons, every Friday afternoon, we have something called Aletheia Kai Didaskalia, Truth and Doctrine, where we would do that. We would go through systematic theology together, and we would cover the 10 major areas of systematic theology, and the goal is to help the people to continue to have that absolute confidence in the authority and sufficiency and inerrancy of the Bible, and to develop a biblical worldview and biblically based convictions. So do you see what I was trying to tell you when I say that we're trying to hit them from different angles, right? So to continue to equip them as much as we can. And so ultimately we are hoping that we will open this preaching institute, which is still attached to the local church. The board of our, that preaching institute is the elder board of the church. And at the moment, where well, all the faculty <laughs> goes to the same church, go to that church that you've seen, the Ankadiva to Biblical Baptist Church. So we kind of, we are not able to run away from one another. <laughs> we are in this <laughs> for a very long time, okay? And we want to use the church as a model of what we teach and preach at that institute. Finish, I just wanted to share with you, you know this verse, but uh, Ephesians 2, verse 19 to 22 is what it says, so then you are no longer strangers and sojourners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole building being joined together is what? Growing. As a building brought together as the church, we are together doing what? Growing into a holy sanctuary in the Lord in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. That's why church-based training matters. It's because we, the church, have been called uniquely to be worshipers, witnesses, and demonstrators of the faith we proclaim. Amen. Amen. Amen.